Welcome to Gospel in Life. Thank you for joining as we go through this special series of meditations by Tim Keller, Trusting God in Difficult Times. This new series is meant to encourage you to trust God more deeply and to meditate on His Word and what it promises to give you strength and hope in difficult times. And now here's today's meditation. Psalm 91, it begins verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, and God I trust. A little, later on it says, He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. You will not fear the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. A thousand may fall at your side, it will not come near you. In verse 11 and 12 it says, He will command His angels to guard you, in all your ways so that you will not stub your foot against a stone. So the promise of this psalm is that God will keep you safe. He's a refuge. He will keep you safe. But how do we understand that promise? What does it mean? Now I can tell you what Satan wants you to think about this promise. I can tell you how Satan wants you to read this this psalm. You might say, how do you know that? Well, As uh, Shakespeare says in The Merchant of Venice, uh, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. And that is exactly what uh, the devil does in Luke chapter 4, when uh, we're talking about Jesus Christ in the wilderness, he's being tempted by the devil. And one of the ways in which the devil tempts Jesus is he actually cites Psalm 91. So there he is, the devil citing scripture. And he quotes the place which says in verse 11 and 12, Uh, He will command his angels uh, to guard your way so you won't even stub your toe on a stone. And he says, don't go to the cross. Don't suffer. If God really loved you, he wouldn't let you suffer. That's what Psalm 91 says. Now you see how brilliant the devil is. Look at the strategy. If the devil can get a Christian to believe that now that I'm a Christian, God will not let any really, really big bad things happen to me. He might let me have a couple of bad things. In general, now that I'm a Christian, God won't let any really bad things happen to me. If you believe that, and really bad things will happen to you, (laughs) then you're going to pull back from God. You're going to say the promise didn't work. And that's exactly what Satan wants. I hope there's nobody out there that's, that's already happened to you, but it might be. It might be that you believe that, or you have believed that. But that's not at all what the text is saying. Now, the best way to understand any part of the Bible is to compare it with the rest of the Bible. So, because there's a great place in uh, the Anglican Church's 39 Articles where it says we must never expound one place of Scripture that it be repugnant to another. It's another way of saying you must never take one one Scripture and read it in a way that it actually contradicts another one. We need to look at them together. And here's three other passages. Uh, And now we'll see, in light of these passages, what it means that God keeps you safe. Uh, Genesis 50 verse 20 is a place where Joseph, at the end of a long life in which he was abused, falsely accused, enslaved, uh, convicted, falsely convicted of crime, at the very end of his life he looks at his brothers who had done all this to him and he says, you meant it for evil but God meant it for good. And what Joseph is saying is, I was a spoiled brat and I was going in a bad direction. The family was a dysfunctional family. But if I had not been sent to Egypt, if I hadn't become a slave, if I hadn't become a convict, uh, if I hadn't uh, been brought down here, I would not have been able to rise up, become prime minister, and save not only many people from famine, but even save my own family from their, their sin and, and show them how to repent. And, and God, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good which means God was keeping me safe when he sold me into slavery. God was keeping me safe and all of us safe when I was put into that dungeon. In hindsight, God was keeping me safe, but in the moment, it didn't look like it. Another verse would be Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, look at that word together. It says, it doesn't say all things are good it doesn't say, oh, even the bad things, if you just look at them, every cloud has a silver lining. Nothing so shallow and un- unfeeling as that. Many, many bad things that happen are bad. They're just bad. But what this is saying is, 
together, God works things together. He brings his power to bear on things so that in the long run, and only we will only see this from the, the standpoint of the end of history, all things will have moved in the direction, just like Joseph saw, of God's glory and our good. But here's my most famous, uh, my, my favorite passage to read. This is Luke chapter 21, verse 16, 17, 18. This is where Jesus is telling uh, his disciples that they're going to be persecuted and bad things are going to happen to them. And yet he's going to stand by them and he's going to keep them safe. And this is what it says. You will be betrayed, some put to death, and yet not a hair of your head will perish. In patience you will possess your souls. Did you hear that? You will be betrayed, some will be put to death. Some of you will be put to death, but not a hair of your head will perish. What in the world does that mean? But here's what it means, especially if you look at what it, he, he means uh, when he says, in, in, in patience you will possess your souls. If you live for anything more than God, if there's anything in your life that's more important to you than God, whether it's your career, whether it's a child, anything more important than God, you are not safe. Not at all. Because circumstances can come and threaten that thing or take that thing away and then you don't have a life left. You don't have a self left. You don't have a, a meaning in life left. But if during difficult times we learn to take, the, uh, take our hearts off of some of the things that we probably make too important to us, they're almost like pseudo salvations or they're, they're substitutes for God. It's only as we more and more come not to love our career less, not to love our child less, but to love God more in relationship to them. Then and only then do we possess our own souls, as it were. Otherwise, we're enslaved. The career possesses our souls. The more and more God possesses our souls, the more we are actually in charge too. The more we possess our own souls. And that means we're finally safe. And therefore, what God is saying in this Psalm 91 is not, I will protect you from all trouble, but I will protect you not only in all trouble, but even through it. I will make you safer through the trouble. And the only way we are absolutely sure that God is really doing that, that he's not just punishing us for our sins, is to remember when he says, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. The image of a mother bird covering her children, covering her chicks, is an image that not only Psalm 91 uses of God, but even Jesus uses it when he comes into Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you knew the things that pertain to your peace, I would have covered you over like a mother hen covers over her chicks. Uh, you know what that means? The mother is being a substitute. If there's terrible sun coming down, heat coming down on the chicks, the mother gets the heat. If there's horrible rain and wind, the mother gets the rain and wind. If there's a predator coming to eat, the mother gets eaten. And Jesus Christ on the cross took what you and I deserve for our sin so that you can know that, no, we're not being punished for our sin. We're being kept safe. We're being kept safe no matter what happens. You can trust him. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. And now here's Tim and Kathy Keller for a short time of Q&A on today's meditation. Most people are used to reading the promises that they uh, find in the Bible as guarantees for safety and happiness in this world, which is what you were saying. But when it doesn't turn out to work out that way, they get either confused or else they get angry. And I think when you say that that really comes down to not really understanding the Bible in its entirety, that they're, they're using it kind of as a promise box, taking things out of context. Yeah. Um, they certainly are reading their understanding of happiness into any, uh, uh, any of the biblical promises that God will, will keep you safe and keep you and you can be content in him for example there's a lot of places where it talks about being content in god and you know, a lot of us think well content means two homes <laughs> um, and a really nice wardrobe and and uh plenty of money to put our kids through college we have to do some public repentance here because as you will know inside both of our wedding rings you can take yours off too we took psalm 34 verse 3 out of context i'll read it to you it says um, glorify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name forever. And that seemed like a really nice verse for a newly married couple, and we put it inside 
both of our wedding rings, just the citation, not the whole verse. Um, but the rest of the psalm is all about suffering and how, um, you know, God is going to deal with people who suffer. In, in particular, the thing that, uh, uh, that jumped wow. out at me when I was memorizing this not too long ago is uh, verse 20 where it says, He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. And of course, in the Gospels, that's applied to Jesus on the cross, that not one of his bones were broken. Right. So you want to say, well, he protected all of his bones, but uh, crucifixion, you know, he got crucified. So that a lot of God's promises, it finally dawned on me, are met on the far side of resurrection, not on the near side of resurrection. And we, we tend to think, well, if it's not going to happen here and now, then what good is it? Well, it is. But I think, don't you think we owe, the, owe ourselves an apology for taking that out of context? Agreed. If you found today's meditation encouraging, please subscribe below and be sure to share it with a friend to encourage them as well. And if you'd like to hear more teachings by Tim Keller, you can listen to new sermons every week at gospelandlife.com slash podcast. Thanks again for watching Gospel and Life.